All right. Good morning, Remembrance Community Church. My name is Pastor Kenny. It is always great to be together gathering on Sunday mornings. Uh, and like Brittany said, we are in a new series. We started with an intro last week. If you didn't get a chance to uh, hear that, it's called Gracious Orthodoxy. I would really recommend that you go back and you, you check that out. It kind of frames the, 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 the type of posture that we want to have as we hold our, our, our what we believe, our doctrine, right? And this morning we're beginning the series and we're going to be talking about uh, the authority of Scripture, that the Scripture is authoritative. And so do we have our slides, uh, Big Tim? Yeah. All right. So what we believe. And um, as I've been studying uh, uh, this week and praying and pre prepping for this, um, this, what does the Bible say and should we trust it? Um, the Bible is authoritative. That's what we believe. How do we, why do we believe that? All of that stuff. Um, I keep getting this I kept getting this uh, remembrance of this scene from one of my favorite movies growing up called uh, National Lampoon's Vacation. And there's this, if you, if you didn't see the movie, it's basically uh, Chevy Chase plays uh, Clark Griswold and his family is traveling across the country and they're heading to an uh, amusement park for a family vacation called Wally World. And along the way, it's a comedy, so along the way, they just have all these, you know, things that come up uh, that you would, maybe are stereotypical, and maybe are like outlandish, whatever, uh, like w that you would imagine. Any, everything that could go wrong on a family vacation goes wrong, and how they react to it is kind of, it's interesting. And in this scene, they end up, he tries to do a shortcut. Any of you guys uh, driving ever, ever tried to like do a shortcut that went wrong? right? So he gets off the interstate, and he tries to do this shortcut, and they get lost. And it's this it's stereotypical white suburban family in a stereotypical, you know, uh, uh, urban, inner city, dangerous, uh, roll up the windows type neighborhood, right? And so Chevy Chase stops the car and kind of gets out, and he asks for directions, right? Can, can you give me directions? I would show the clip, but there's a little bit of cussing, just a uh, trigger warning. Um, it, it's like one of those movies, you don't remember that, and then you watch it with your kids, and you're like, oh, wait, that, that's, that, maybe we shouldn't be watching this. But, but he stops, and he goes, hey, can you give me directions back to the interstate? And he comes over with his basketball, and he says, what, for free? <laughs> he goes, well, how much is it going to cost? He goes, five dollars. So he pulls out $10 and gives it to him and then puts his hand out like he's going to get change. And the guy says, oh, I guess I'll keep the change, right? And then he, he, he gets down and he, in the window and he's distracting him. And all these people are stealing everything they can off of his car, hubcaps and everything like that. And the guy goes like this. This is basically his advice. This is my paraphrase. He goes, go down the street. You see that sign for the ribs? You don't want to go there. And then he goes, go a little bit past that to the end of the block and you're going to see a car. It has no wheels. It's on blocks. And inside of that car is my cousin. When you get there, tell him you're my boy. And he'll give you directions to the interstate because you don't want directions from me. I'm not even from this neighborhood, right? <laughs> and, then, and then he walks away, right? And so Chevy Chase is feeling like ripped off, right? He's feeling like he didn't get what he needed, directions. And you know, as I was we live in a cancel culture. I'm like, can you, you know, I'm not going to do the accents and stuff like that. Like, can you really do this? Could you make this movie today? Those are one of the questions we debate about. But then I thought, you know what, this is an appropriately inappropriate analogy. It captures how I think many of us feel often in this life. Lost and scared and needing directions. We've all probably felt like people have taken our money and, and ripped us off, given us nothing in return. Empty promises, right, from people, from culture, from the latest gimmick or fad that promised to fix all your problems, you know, for a small, you know, fee. But wait, there's more, right? We are leery of fake news. We're leery of being deceived, being duped, or led astray. And really, we just need someone who can give us a trustworthy 
local knowledge. We need somebody who will give us credible information. And here he thinks he's going to get some local knowledge and all he gets is ripped off. And, 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 the, and, and well, he's looking for some credible you know, direction that would help and he gets nothing. And the Gen Z Bible might say, we're looking for no cap 411. If you don't know what that means, uh, welcome to the club. <laughs> but in theology, we call this an authoritative source. We need an authoritative source. And so we believe in the authority of scriptures. That's a statement. I believe, we believe in the authority of the scriptures. And this morning, I want to cover some ideas about what this actually means to say that we believe in the authority of scripture. Uh, and perhaps we want to think about some debatable elements within what this might mean or, what, or doesn't mean. And lastly, we want to open up a dialogue, which we'll call at the end when we get to the so what section. So what? Why does this matter? How should this impact our day-to-day -day lives? And I say we're going to begin this conversation because like Brittany shared, we really want to invite you to come to either a community group where you can discuss this a little bit more, or if that's not something that you're able to do in your life, at least commit to having this conversation more in depth, whether it's with a spouse or a friend or, or just somebody else who's a believer. Talk about this stuff. Talk about this sermon. You can listen to it again. We don't want to just... Uh, uh, hear it and get some information. We want this to be transformative. So the key text for this morning is going to be from 2 Timothy 3, if you want to turn there. And I want to invite you to stand if you're willing and if you're able uh, as we read God's Word this morning about God's Word. And this is a, a Paul is, is writing this as a second instructional letter to Pastor Timothy who is he has the task of, uh, and it's a difficult task, of going in and pastoring a, a church that's gone astray a bit in Ephesus. And he tells him this, All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be complete equipped for every good this is God's word, and you may be seated. Well, perhaps Paul here is giving us really two important uh, doctrinal helps in this small little section that you can continue to see on the board and continue to uh, follow along as we talk about and dissect this a little bit. And the first thing is he gives us a really good definition of Scripture. What is Scripture? And I would say that the answer, and Paul would probably agree in this text, is that it, the, the, the scriptures are the inspired and authoritative word of God. The inspired and authoritative word of God. And he says it's useful for teaching us and others. That's why it's part of it being authoritative. It's useful for teaching us and for, for us to teach others, to teach our kids, to teach our families, to teach, just to teach others. It's also useful for showing us areas that we need to work on, right? Anybody have some areas in your life that you need to work on? And he calls this rebuking or reproof. And it's useful for showing us how to work on those. Not just like, hey, pointing out some bad things, but it also brings correction, which means teaching you how to do it better, what to do different. And then it's useful for exercising our faith, and making us more like Jesus, which he calls training in righteousness. Jesus was the example of what righteousness looks like, and we want to be more like Jesus. And the Word of God trains us for that. So it's, it, it, it's a good definition, and it, it's the inspired Word, inspired and authoritative. And then secondly, this passage, Paul highlights the importance of understanding its authoritative nature. And there's two authoritative purposes or benefits that Paul gives us at the end. And the first one is that it will make us complete. The, the scriptures are authoritative and they're useful to make us complete. How many of you remember the Jerry Maguire line, right? That old, I think it's a 90s or early 2000s movie, You Complete Me. 
The Bible makes us complete. It completes us. To complete in, in the Bible, in scriptures, it often is referring to a transformative process where we become uh, more like Jesus. To complete us is to bring us to completion, to bring us to maturity. And our goal is to be more like Jesus, right? Paul, in, in, in the book of Philippians, the letter to the Philippians in chapter 1, 6, he goes, you can be confident of this, that he who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it on the, on the day of Christ Jesus, right? Jesus, when he's praying in John 17, the high priestly prayer, he goes, he asks God, sanctify them uh, by your word, by the scriptures. In other words, bring them to completion, sanctify them, make them more the way that they're supposed to be, cleanse them and change them and, and, and make them healed, right, in Christ. So it can make us complete. We believe as a strategy for, for seeing people become more like Jesus, a disciple formation strategy, we believe in what's called the triangle of transformation. And the triangle has three points. We are transformed by the truth, which we find primarily in the scriptures. That's what we're saying is this is truth. The scriptures. In community, that's another point. We do this in community. And we do this through practices. And all of it in the center is all empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so the scriptures are key for transformation, to be complete. And then he goes on and he says, and also equipped for every good work. Right? In, in Ephesians, uh, Paul says in Ephesians 2.10, he goes, we are, Christ, we are God's workmanship, poema, like his, or masterpiece, what he's working on. Right? We're his art piece. We're his poema, his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he prepared in advance for us to do. The lot in there, right? God has a plan for our life. We need the word to show us the way and, and as a part of that process to equip us to do the good works that he's prepared in advance for us to do and that we can only do because we, we have Christ, right? The scriptures are incredibly important. And here's a couple of thoughts of what the Bible's not trying to be or do, right? It doesn't mention in here that the Bible is, uh, 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 its goal is to establish a code, kind of like a country club, right, of, of the behavior that you need to do to be on the inner circle, right, to be acceptable at the, you know, Christian club. It doesn't, that's not its point, is to decide who's good and who's bad. It's a centralized message that reminds us that we're all broken and in need of a savior. And it points us to that savior who teaches us how to be human again, how to be whole, how to be complete. It also is not trying to give simple answers to com life's complex questions. Sometimes when we try to make the Bible give simple answers to life's complex issues, we get things wrong. We become Un, un, unhealthily dogmatic, right? Judgmental, legalistic. Because we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make this thing uh, just give simple answers that are blanket, true for all, in all things. And really what it's doing is it's giving us enough wisdom to be able to discern what to do in every circumstance. It's training us to do that, to be wise. And so one of the great books that I love from Brad East, it's called The Church's Book, Theology of Scripture in Ecclesial Context. Ecclesial has to do with like church, you know, like the church, how the church should function. The church, theology of Scripture in Ecclesial. And he, he goes in here, and, and if, if you don't like theology, you know, don't read this book. But if you do, he, he looks at, he compares from history some, some, uh, some great theologians like Karl Barth and a couple of others, and what they thought about, you know, how the church should be and function. But he does give a great... Uh, uh, definition in this book. This is the book's worth this, this, I think, quote. He says, the Bible is a gift from God to the church, and it's given for a particular purpose, and that is to shape that community into the kind of people who can fulfill their commission to make disciples of all nations and to steward God's good creation, anticipating its final redemption." It's a book that shapes us in that way. That's what it's trying to do. 
And so as we delve uh, deeper into the profound nature of, uh, uh, of Scripture's authority, I want to transition uh, from uh, kind of this under, trying to understand and define terms uh, and how it transforms us. And I want to explore the very essence of its authority a little bit deeper. And so the, the Bible, the nature of Scripture, there's really three, uh, three, at least three things I'll say that the Bible says about itself when it comes to its authoritative nature. The first one you'll see on the screen is that it has divine origin, a.k.a. it's God-breathed. And so we see in our text in 2 Timothy 3, 16, right in the beginning, it says, all Scripture is inspired by God. Another way of saying that, it's God-breathed. The Apostle Peter says something similar. In 1 Peter 21, he goes, Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So when we say the Bible has a divine origin, we believe it has human authors that were carried along, helped, inspired by God, in such a way that God was carrying them along and making sure that they did it the way that he would approve. It has divine origin. In other words, the Bible is authoritative if and because God wrote it. And so all the characteristics of God, his goodness, his wisdom, right? His, all the things... They all, that, that nature of that is all found within our scriptures because it has a divine origin. It also is, the Bible says about itself, it is an unchanging truth, a source of unchanging truth. In, it has enduring relevance from to, across time and culture. And in the Psalms, Psalm 119, it says, Lord, your word is forever. It is firmly fixed in heaven. When you compare the Bible to any other religious books, one of the profound things that you're going to find is most religions have either fallen away because they actually became outdated or they've changed their spiritual documents to update to be more relevant, right? Uh, and then this is no shade, but like the Book of Mormon, fact. It has thousands of changes that have been made to it. They have the theology that there's a current prophet that can change the book at any time, right? To keep up with the times. The Bible has never had to do that. The Bible has never done that. It's fixed. Because it's true. It's true in every age. Isaiah the prophet Isaiah 40, 7 through 8, he says, The grass withers, the flowers fade, when the breath of the Lord blows on them. It's very poetic, right? In other words, God has made things to be that way, that they have a season and then they wither. Indeed, the people are grass, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God remains forever. So the Bible is the unchanging truth. That's what the Bible says about itself. And it's final authority. It's a source of final authority or supreme authority or ultimate authority. If everybody has an opinion, which let's face it, when I go to the fire department in the morning and we sit around and have coffee, everyone has an opinion. They all know how to fix everything. Uh, you know, if you were to put them in charge of anything, they, don't, they mess everything up. But, but at the coffee table, they're all the supreme authority. And what we're saying is, you know, you, you get news from CNN, you get news from Fox News, you get whatever, you get all the news. This is the news that is ultimate. This is primary. And this is Jesus' own words, Matthew 24. He goes, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. In other words, it's primary, it's ultimate, it's solid, it's secure, it's reliable. And so that's what the Bible teaches us about itself. So clearly, clearly the Bible says about itself that it is a word from God that holds ultimate authority. What do other experts and scholars say about it? I mean, that's, this, this isn't taboo. In theology, we call 
the work of testing the Bible's reliability, which a lot of work has been done, just really testing it from, from uh, 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 what we call text criticism. Text criticism is a process, a scientific, you know, actual process that you can test any ancient document and see, is this reliable, right? And the Bible uh, has, been, has been tested through text criticism more than any other book that's ever been written. Here are some of the test-proof reasons to trust in the reliability of Scripture. I'm going to give you four. I'm going to give you four, okay? Four simple ones. I want you to know that there is a deep dive available that we cannot get into, like just super deep. I mean, the more you try to study honestly about the Bible, the more you're going to be convinced of the things that it claims. I mean, it is remarkable, it is miraculous, it holds the test of time. Every time it's been tested by somebody who's sincere and honest, so many people in history have have tested this as a skeptic and turned out to be a believer because it just, you know, they couldn't prove it false, so it proved them (laughs) it true, right? One of the things in text criticism that's pretty uh, uh, profound is that there's a lot of manuscripts. That means, so the Bible was written on like animal skin, and so obviously that doesn't last very long. It's gone. It's deteriorated. God did not choose to sustain the original autographs. It would have taken a miracle, and he could have done that. He did not choose to do that. So we don't have the actual handwritten first copies. We have copies of copies of copies, and we have a ton of them. Manuscripts means actual handwritten Handwritten, not on a printing press, not after the Gutenberg, you know, uh, a press. This is handwritten early copies. And there's over 6,000 manuscripts of the New Testament alone. If you're like, okay, uh, is that a good, <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, just to give you a little reference, this is the number one through text criticism. Not through Kenny says it or Christians say it. Through text criticism, this is the number one most reliable ancient writing. 6,000 manuscripts is one reason. The next, the second uh, uh, highest or or most credible would be uh, Homer's The Iliad. And we have 600 copies. You have 600 copies of Homer's The Iliad. And experts say, oh, it is super tight. And those same experts who look at the Bible have 6,000 go, hmm. I'm still questioning, right? Maybe an agenda (laughs) is all I'm saying. And so we're able to compare these writings, and they're able to cross-check them, okay? And they're written in different areas, different locations in the world, through different time periods. And they take all these manuscripts. How many of you guys have ever played the game Telephone, right? At like a kid's birthday party where you go, like, you know, the pink elephant is flying through the circus, right? And then the next person tries to repeat what they said, and then by the end of like 10 kids are like, you know, my pink pony is better than your pink pony, right? And it just gets all messed up. What we're saying is it's been, it's been, been, been translated and copied and copied and copied and copied, and we have 6,000 copies, and they're all basically the same. I mean, there's minor, there's minor, as you would expect, right? There's minor like like, oh, there's a punctuation in this one that wasn't there, right? Or they, they spelt this word wrong. It had one letter off, right? And so there's 6,000 copies. We can actually look at them, and we could go over all these periods of times, different cultures and different languages even, and we go, oh, these are similar, if not the same. And all of the, the differences, they're minute. None of them would change anyone's theological doctrine or belief. They're just little errors. And so we have just this incredibly uh, 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 great testing method. And the Bible stands up to the most stringent secular tests. It also has archaeological evidence. There are thousands, if not more, archaeological finds that when they find them, they validate the Bible's places, its events, and its people, right? 
The Bible makes all of these claims and stories of what was happening in these different times. And then they'll, they'll go, well, that can't be true. And then they'll find an archaeological find and they'll go, oh, that's what the Bible was talking about. There are no archaeological finds that have ever disproved a single biblical event, civilization, or individual. Now, there are people who have made claims that there are, but then when other people, you know, it's easy in an echo chamber on a blog to be like, the Bible says this, and you can come up with all these things, and there's nobody there to debate you. Like, that's, a, that's, e- that's weak. People do that. But then when they stand up and they debate a biblical scholar, they, they, they'd be debunked. If you want to know more on here, there's webethinking.org. Cool name, right? On that website, there are a ton, a deep dive of all these cool archaeological finds that I'm talking about. If you want to dig deeper into it, be my guest. I would encourage you to do that. There's also books that have been written uh, about this. There's so many resources on this topic. I'm going to give you one in a minute, one resource that is very recent and is my favorite, and I'm going to present it to you, and I would encourage you all, if you're interested in any of this, or want to dig, dig, dig deeper, that's a great start. Now, we also have the original write, belief that the original writings were faithfully preserved. And in 1940, how many of you guys have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? All right, so this is a whole library, a whole library that was found in the Dead Sea, in these caves, right? An incredible library of, of really manuscripts that have been written for many, many years, these, the, 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 whoever preserved this in the Dead Sea Scrolls took great measure because there was persecution and they were burning books and stuff like that, and they hid them away, and we found them in 1940. And what these scriptures do, like it has almost the whole se- uh, uh, book of Isaiah, you know, which was written a thousand years before Jesus, so 3,000 years ago, and then, you know, a hundred years ago, we found, you know, like these really old copies of it. And then they compare it to our modern day uh, Isaiah. And they're like, it's exactly the same. Wow. Right? That's the benefit when people pump up the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's like, hey, people are claiming that we've changed this over a thousand years. Oh, wait, we found one that was a thousand years ago. How come there's no changes then? Right? That's a pretty good argument. And then we have eyewitness accounts. Is there evidence that the originals, let's say we, the originals were accurate. Well, are those even accurate to begin with? Were those telling the truth? Does the Bible provide an accurate account of historical events about Jesus, about the early church, about any of it? Well, here's some thoughts. The four gospels were written 40 to 60 years after Jesus was, was alive. 40 to 60 years. Paul's letter to the Galatians and the Ephesians, there's argument about it, but they were likely written 15 to 20 years after the time of Christ. When you're thinking about like, like this type of thing of writing down a historical uh, a fact about events that happened, uh, these dates are remarkably early in criteria of ancient writings. Remarkably, right? Most people would write about 100 years later or whatever. This is writing very soon after. And it's written from a position to know, society would know if it was true or not, right? Because the people who are, the audience were there when it happened. And they could, they could verify whether or not it's true or not. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, he's making this great speech about uh, uh, the the fact that the resurrection is true, that Jesus did rise from the dead. And his argument is like this. After Jesus rose from the dead, he didn't bolt. He actually stuck around for 40 days. That's what, that's, that, that's the, that's, that's what happened. For 40 days, Jesus was appearing, and, and Paul makes this claim. He goes, at one point, and this is well known, he goes, he made a, a public appearance to over 500 people at one time. And he goes, and those people, most of them are still alive, so go ask them. Like, why would I say this if it's not true, right? It's like, like Otani, you know, he gets accused of maybe stealing, right? And he goes out publicly and he goes, well, I didn't steal. That would be so dumb to do if you did steal. Because someone's going to find out and, they're gonna, and, then the whole, and the whole thing's worse than it ever, right? And Paul is like, no, I'm so confident of this. Hey, 
500 people out there are eyewitnesses that you can go ask even right now, right? So the fact that the Bible is written so early, when people were there who could verify or, or debunk, is amazing and powerful. And the fact that Paul is like, hey, there's, there's all these witnesses. If I'm lying, you know, people are going to know. Check, fact check it. The fact that we have all of these copies of it that are still the same as they were back then, that it hasn't changed. The fact that scientists are digging up dirt all the time, right? Like, like there's, there, it, it, when, if, you, if you were to kill somebody and bury the body, like there's always a fear like they're going to dig up the body, right? Well, they're digging up the evidence and we have nothing to fear. It keeps proving it over and over again. And we even have the Dead Sea Scrolls that come along kind of more recently and just verify once again, like, see, we, God just keeps giving us enough evidence to believe. In short, the copies of the copies that we have are reliable copies. That's what we're saying. Now there are some theological aspects of the Bible that Orthodox believers do debate about. I want to talk about that next. So here's some things that are debatable amongst theologians. You might hear a, a, a debate about the inerrancy of the Bible. The inerrancy of the Bible. So here's a couple questions about inerrancy. Is that debatable? What's the debate about? Why do people debate about this? Is inerrancy a helpful term? Because it's not one that the Bible actually uses. I mean, arguably, some would say, oh, it's talking about it in this way or whether, but it doesn't use this term inerrancy. Should this impact how we interpret the Bible, right? If it's inerrant, would that change the way we actually interpret it? Uh, and so what does it actually refer to? A common statement of belief, a lot of denominations and churches might give you something like this. And when they say the Bible is inerrant, and they mean without error in its original manuscripts, which we don't have, and completely trustworthy in all matters it addresses. That's key. All matters that it addresses, right? Like, is it, when it, when it gives a scientific fact, is that true because it's inerrant? That would, be, that would be part of the debate. John Frame talks about inerrancy in his uh, systematic theology book. He says the Bible, wh what it means when we say the Bible is inerrant, is we say the Bible says exactly what God intended for it to say. So that's a bit different, right? He's not making the claim that, hey, like an example, when Jesus said that, you know, if you had faith uh, the size of a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds, uh, well, actually, now we know that there are seeds that are smaller than that. Was Jesus, is, it, is that an error? Is it no longer an error? And John Frame would say, no, Jesus is actually making a completely different point. He's not making a scientific statement. He's saying, you guys think that's the smallest, so I'm going to use that analogy, and really what I'm saying is, it just takes a little bit of faith, because our, our faith is not in our faith. Our faith is in our God, right? So we can have a small faith and a big God, and big things can happen, is what he's saying. The Bible says exactly what God intended it to say. Stephen Davis wrote a book, uh, uh, kind of is debating whether or not we should use this term, and he says, the Bible is inerrant, if and only if it makes no false or misleading statements on any topic whatsoever. So, so Davis and Frame have a different definition of, of inerrancy. Do you guys see that? Hopefully you do. There's theologians who go, it's inerrant. And they go, oh, this is what that means. And then this person says, no, this is what that means. So there's not really a clear, clear picture. So is it that's the debate. Is it, help, is it a helpful term? That's a question we can ask. Should this impact our interpretation? Right. And then there's the idea of infallibility. Now, for some, infallibility is synonymous with inerrancy. It means the same thing. Right? Then there's a common... Whoops. There's a common uh, uh, understanding of infallibility that's incapable of leading believers astray on matters of faith and practice, okay? Kevin Van Hooser, he says that the scripture is inerrant 
means to confess faith that the authors speak the truth in all things that they affirm when they make uh, affirmations. So basically, one idea of is that uh, maybe infallibility is synonymous. One is that um, that it just doesn't lead us astray when it comes to faith and practice. Uh, another one is when it affirms something. Like in other words, Jesus is not affirming that the mustard seed is the smallest. That's not what he's trying to do. So that that's okay. But what he is affirming is that you just need a little bit of faith and a big God, right? And so that's the infallibility section. Now. One way of thinking about this, if you're like lost, which is good, kind of the point is like people are debating about this and most of us are lost. Like, why does this matter? But then our guy goes like, oh, that church says they're, they don't believe in inerrancy. They're questioning it. Oh no, they're liberal, right? Like, it's very confusing is my point. And so I think we should be a little bit slow to judge people who are working this stuff out, my point, when we think about gracious orthodoxy. Inerrancy... You might think of it in technical terms, to be inerrant. You might say it's technically there's no errors in it, right? And infallible would be matters of intent. And it's, and it's what it's trying to say. It's, it's not, right? And then we get on to an easier one, inspiration. The Bible is inspired by God, meaning that its authors were guided by the Holy Spirit in their writing. Inspired by God. And again, these are the same texts I gave you earlier, 2 Timothy 3.16 and, uh, and 2 Peter. Now, what do I believe? I told you guys that I'm going to make you uncomfortable and tell you there's some different debates and stir this up. And then I'll always tell you, I'll try to tell you, where do I land on this? Here's where I land. I believe, this is where I've worked out to this point, that God worked through human authors in partnership like he often does. And he protected it from saying anything that he did not authorize. I'm totally comfortable with all of those terms. To say the Bible is inerrant, if you said, I, if you're going to be a part of the, you know, this chaplain program, you need to say the Bible is inerrant. Okay, I'll say the Bible is inerrant if we're saying, like John Frame said, like the Bible says exactly what God intended for it to say. I'm okay with infallibility for the same reason, because I see them more as synonymous, if they mean that. I absolutely believe the Bible's inspired, right? That God, uh, and I believe that God uh, worked through human authors, like he often does, and he protected it, and made sure that it didn't say anything that he didn't authorize for it to say. Now, we're looking at some of the debatable stuff with, uh, with actually Orthodox theologians. And I do want to just say this again. I want us to not be the people who see a, a, a thing on, 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 on you know, Facebook or Instagram or some blog and somebody goes, oh, forget about that old you know, Bible college. They're liberal now. There is a danger of crossing an orthodox line. But I also have noted that for many people, the idea of what makes something liberal is anything that's right from whatever I am at, right? And I don't think that that is fair, and I don't think that that is good uh, gracious orthodoxy. I think we should look at some of these old, God is where it is inspired, it is authoritative. When somebody, a theologian, is going, is it inerrant? Well, it depends on what you mean by that, right? Like, if we're trying to say that, you know, that there are no errors in it scientifically, if we're trying to make it, then, then no, it isn't inerrant, right? Maybe that's not a helpful word, right? But if, if it is saying this, right? And so there, there's, there's theologians who are having this really good debate, and then they're getting labeled as, like, you know, a heretic, and I think it's unfair. That's my point. Does that make sense? And so I would be cautious about that. But skeptics might say that the Bible was written by human hands, therefore it's flawed. That's a very common and valid argument if you're trying to figure out whether or not you're going to follow Jesus. You know, hey, it's a human book. Everything that a human touches, in our experience, has at least some error to it. So how can we say that it has no errors, right? 
And sometimes they give what I would call a straw man discrepancies in the Bible. Straw man is when you build a case that's really weak, like straw, and it's easy to knock over. One common one, and this was flooding through uh, TikTok, is they were, they were saying, how can you believe the Bible's true? The Bible believes in unicorns. What's your, what's your answer? And there are nine times in the King James Version where the Bible references a unicorn. The original language does talk about a one-horned animal. The interpreter chose a long time ago, before it was like there was TikTok, to use the term unicorn, one horn, to translate. Of course, we know now that we use unicorn, we think of a mythological thing that doesn't exist. But can any of you think of an animal that has one horn? Okay, good. So that's a straw man argument. Oh, the Bible says unicorns, but the original says one horn. Those do exist, right? It's a straw man argument. And then people will look at flawed human interpretation. When we're saying that the Bible, if we say the Bible is inerrant, like God inspired and inerrant, right? We're not saying that our interpretations are inerrant. When we try to understand it, we get things wrong. And there have been people in history who have gotten things wrong. And those are easy to like, oh, if I can disprove your interpretation, then I disprove the Bible. No, that's not how it works. And then there's non problematic discrepancies. Example being, there's four accounts in the gospel, gospel accounts of Jesus's life, right? And sometimes there's four accounts of the same story. And within those four accounts, uh, you'll get some discrepancy. Like he says it this way, he says it this way, he talks about it like this, he talks about it like this. Is this problematic? No. I, don't, I would say no. I would defend. If four of us drove through Yosemite and then tried to describe it, we would probably use different language, point out different things, use different chronology. No, I saw this and this and this, and one person's like, in order, that's what I saw. And the other person's like, oh, in, in what impressed me, that's the order, right? So you would expect that humans are going to give you a little bit of variance, different perspective. That's a good thing, not a discrepancy. So I call those non-problematic discrepancies. In 2 Peter 1.21, it says, oh, in 2 Peter uh, 1.21, it says, because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's our claim. Yes, men wrote it. Why is there no heirs? Because God came along and carried them and made sure there was no heirs. It's not because the humans were perfect. It's because God made it that way. Right? And so that's why the, we, we, we do believe there's human authorship and divine authorship, and it's perfect, not because the humans, but because God was involved. The Bible was written long ago, therefore it is no longer relevant. How many of you ever thought that, right? And though it was written in ancient context, its principles transcend time and culture. That's what the Bible says about itself. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and it is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So the Bible itself says it's timeless, but the testimony of the saints, the testimony of the church, is what's powerful, I think, here to the skeptic. I have found that the Bible is still relevant and applicable and helpful and the best source that I've found for training me, for correcting me, for making me wise, right? I have a testimony that the Bible is still useful in my life. Anyone else? Right? And so what we're saying is, yes, the skeptics can say it's not relevant, but you have a whole church that's saying, well, we're using it effectively and it's relevant. Skeptics might say that the Bible's filled with scientific contradictions. Therefore, it's debunked. I gave you one example, right? Jesus said that the, the, if you have faith like a mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds, and now we know like there's a bunch of orchids that have, are really the smallest seeds. Uh, and some people will make the argument like, well, maybe there were no or orchids 2,000 years ago when Jesus was saying that. Maybe it was true at the time, right? Like, mm, we don't even need to 
do that, right? Jesus is not trying to make a scientific statement, amen? He's trying to make a statement about faith and God. And he can use analogies that we would understand, and he often does, and the Bible often does, to make the actual point that he's trying to make. That actual point is the truth. That actual point is the inspired part, right? That, that actual point is what we could say is inerrant. That actual point is what's infallible. When we try to make the other parts those things, that's where all the debate is, right? And it's a good debate. It's right. Like, if, if, if this is trying to be a scientifically valid book, then it's not, sometimes. But that's not what it's trying to do. The mistake is to not differentiate between spiritual truth and scientific observations. It's not meant to be a scientific textbook. Here's a great quote by Dr. Bruce Ashford. He says, The Bible does not use technical or scientific language, and it does not give scientific theories. I mean, it, it, what he's saying is it does use scientific, but not for the purpose of, of being a scientific you know, book. Instead, it uses language that would be accessible to the persons who are observing the world from an ordinary human standpoint. John Walton, a great theologian, says it like this. The Bible was written for us, but it was not written to us. And it was written in a way that the people it was written to would understand it. And we need to understand that in order to contextualize it for our own lives, right? It's written for us, but it wasn't written to us. In church history, interpret, interpretations of scriptures have often changed with major scientific uh, discoveries, and that's okay. The Bible didn't change, and the world didn't change. Our interpretations changed because we had it wrong, because we're human. I think that's important for us to grasp. Example one Last week we talked about the Copernican Revolution, right? We used to believe that everything revolved around us. The sun and everything else revolved around the earth because we were the centerpiece of God's creation, so of course everything revolves around us. And then Nicholas Copernicus comes and says, uh, no, actually, we've, we've, we're compelling evidence. <laughs> we actually revolve, everything revolves around the sun, right? That's the way God made it. And people freaked out. You're a heretic, Right? They were wrong, and they've changed now. Now we, I, don't, I mean, don't raise your hand, right? Bigfoot is real, though, but the world's not flat. Example two, there was a time when many, most theologians believed that the earth was square. Did you know that? Why? Because the Bible talks about the four corners of the earth. Let me ask you guys, you know, just a preschool question. Do circles or spheres have corners? Well, then how can the Bible be round if it says there's corners, right? It's not what the Bible's trying to say, right? It's using poetic, metaphorical language to make a statement. But there were literally people that were like, the Bible proves it. It's a square, right? Now they know differently. And this barely, barely scratches the surface of all of the compelling reasons why we should believe the Bible. I would encourage you, if you have kids that are about to go to college or in college, or if you're a kid that's about to go to college, or if you're a kid that never went to college and doesn't want to go to college, or whatever, right? If you have neighbors, grandkids, read this book. Bill Mounts. He says, why should I trust the Bible? Answers to real questions and doubts people have about the Bible. And now we'll get to the so what. Why talk about this? It is always good to reaffirm the authority of the scriptures. I was listening to a podcast that Bill Mounts was doing. He's brilliant. I listened to a lot of his stuff. He's great. And he said, he said, when was the last time you heard a sermon about text criticism? Now all of you guys can say, I was today years old, right? It's good to to remember these things, and that the, that the Bible is essential for vibrant uh, uh, and thriving faith. Secondly, there's a call to action with the authority of Scripture. When we believe that Jesus is worth following and then commit to reorienting our lives 
around that conviction. We have the Bible, we do it in community, we do it with practices, we do it with the Holy Spirit, but we have the Bible. And so, if the Bible is authoritative, then we should do what it says. To the best of our ability, our interpretations might not be right. and We can walk through that and wrestle through that. But in my estimation and in my own life, there are plenty of things that I already really believe the Bible says that I don't live up to. And so I have work to do. Oftentimes I'll have a premarital counseling and I'll have a couple, right? And they're like, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk and I'll be like, you know, I'm awkward. That's cool. We're drinking coffee. Are you guys sleeping together? You guys living together, right? I just wanted to help you out. And they'll, oh yeah, you know, but you know, rent's so expensive, right? And all this stuff, right? Okay. What do you believe the Bible says about that? Well, do you want to start your marriage off on the healthy plane of obedience to Christ? And so I lay before you an opportunity to repent and do something different because you believe in the authority of Scripture. And there's a million places, right? Your attitude, your, your, how you treat people, your work ethic. I mean, this thing is just great at helping us be really better people. And when people see this thing making us better people, it's compelling them to want to look into this thing. And then lastly, and we'll have, the, we'll have the, the whole worship team. All of the worship team. You guys all come up. Lastly here. We should use the belief in the authority of Scripture when we're disciple making, when we're, when we're working with other people and helping them follow Jesus as apprentices. We should use it as a building block. And here's how I believe it should work. First, our goal is is to help them believe that God's way is worth following. And like it says in the beginning of Hebrews, Jesus is our best first pointing. Like point them to Jesus. Is Jesus compelling to you? You don't have to answer all of the Old Testament unicorn questions and all that. Is Jesus a compelling figure for you? Is God's way worth following if Jesus is the one we follow in order to follow God's way. And then, we want to talk and help them believe that the Bible is an authoritative source for doing that. And then, one step at a time, we want to help them work on obedience to God's word as a pathway to Jesus following. Now Paul, in 1 Corinthians, goes to great length to say, don't do it otherwise than this. He says, 1 Corinthians, he goes, we don't judge those who are outsiders. But don't we judge in the sense that we're trying to get in their life and help them think through some things, those who are inside? And what he means is, those who believe in the authority of Scripture, well then help them, help them interpret it and apply it. Those who don't believe in the authority of scripture you're wasting your time going you should do this because the bible says this well i don't believe in the bible so who cares right and and, oh yeah whatever right great evangelism no we want to point to jesus he's a compelling figure we want to say what does jesus say about the bible he says it's timeless He, he quotes it all the time now let's look into the bible and now let's start to step by step figure out how to reorient our lives using the Bible as our credible source. That's how we use the Bible. Does that make sense? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to remind ourselves not only of of how trustworthy and useful and helpful and authoritative the Bible is, but also a little warning about how not to bang people over the head with it. How to guide people with it and, and, and not hammer them away with it. I pray that you would give us the help to do that. And I pray that if there's anyone this morning who's convicted about something in the scriptures that they already know that maybe your Holy Spirit is saying, hey, I want you to work on this this week. I pray that, I pray that they, would, they, they, would, they would open themselves up to you and lay that down and ask you for help and ask others for help. And I pray 
for those uh, in our lives that, that we're just heartbroken because they, they don't yet see the, the, the value of Jesus and they don't yet see the value of the scriptures. And we just pray for them, that you would, you would be working in, in, in your own ways to make yourself known to them and that you would help us uh, be useful in making uh, uh, you and your goodness known to them. I pray that you would, you would help us to be people of the Bible that are, that are interpreting it well, that are holding it with humility, that are applying it faithfully, and that are pointing people to it graciously. And I just pray this in Jesus' name.